Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today, we're going to be exploring the fourth film from one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, Wes Anderson, with The Life Aquatic. Maybe Anderson's most divisive movie in a lot of people's eyes. So, without further ado, let's get into it. I'm also going to let you know that this will be discussing full spoilers for The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. All of these Wes Anderson reviews leading up to Asteroid City will all feature spoilers, so just letting you know right now. So the basic premise for this movie is we follow Steve Zissou, an oceanographer, and his crew as they look to make a documentary about them finding the shark that killed his friend in a previous documentary. Now, as you may know, Wes Anderson movies don't really cost a lot of money and they don't really make a lot of money. But in this case, The Life Aquatic was actually a box office disaster in some cases. It did not manage to make back its budget of $50 million, only grossing $34 million. And it also had a pretty poor critical reaction. Maybe the worst of his entire career. If you look at Rotten Tomatoes especially, which is just review aggregate, it is his lowest rated film at only a 57%. Now, thankfully with The Life Aquatic, it managed to move past that and I think has reached cult status. I think a lot of people really, really enjoy this movie. And over the years, it has become appreciated more and more over time. So let's look at why this was a failure in the beginning and managed to work its way up to being a hit for a lot of people and a really beloved movie. I think for starters, this was the furthest that Wes Anderson had gone with his style at the time. The beauty of watching his filmography in order is you really see an evolution of his style. He always pushes it to the next step. Even today, I know some people like to say that he's kind of stuck in the mud a little bit, but no, I really think he continues to evolve film after film. He does new things. And while yes, some of the same tropes can be seen in all of his films, he does do things visually that really change what we're used to from him. And The Life Aquatic to me is one of his biggest jumps. His first three films in Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, and The Royal Tenenbaums all took this steady climb into the Wes Anderson that we know of now. The Life Aquatic, I think, is the first film where we really start to see the full style of what Wes Anderson can present. This is the closest to the Grand Budapest Hotel than his first three movies, stylistically. And that might have not really gone over well with many audiences and critics because it was something completely different to what we're used to. The characters talk in a different kind of way. The style choices are nothing like we've ever seen before. It does take some inspiration from French cinema, but not to this kind of length. And that might be jarring for a lot of people. Some people to this day cannot connect with a lot of Wes Anderson characters because of the way that he writes them. They have a quirky way of talking that is very unique to his style. And I think that took a bit of adjusting for a lot of people in the beginning. While his first three films are very smaller in scale than The Life Aquatic, being this more ambitious film, it just might have taken away from what people really loved about his last film in The Royal Tenenbaums. Now, I've seen this film twice, and I really love this film. The first time I watched it, I was on board with calling it one of his best. I really, really love his style, and being the first kind of iteration of just Wes Anderson going ham was really cool to see. I love that this story in particular really fits his style of dialogue. The characters are very interesting. Steve Zissou, played by Bill Murray, is maybe the closest we've gotten to having a sole lead character in a Wes Anderson film in his entire filmography. Bill Murray plays this role really well. It's one of my favorite performances of him. Steve Zissou is a very interesting character and him trying to bond with his son played by Owen Wilson over the course of the film is 
Definitely the thing that pulls at the heartstrings as the film progresses. See, what makes this relationship special in my eyes is that Steve is always putting himself at arm's length from Owen Wilson, who is his son. Or at least that is what we're led to believe throughout the duration of the film. As we know, if you've seen the movie, it is later revealed that Steve Zissou cannot have kids, but Ned, played by Owen Wilson, has believed that this man is his father, and over the course of the film, they actually develop a father-son bond, which was just really, really heartwarming to see in this film. Because Steve is uncertain of what kind of role he wants to play in Ned's life. He kind of takes him on in his crew and sees him more as a buddy than a son, and he ends up competing with him in a lot of ways, especially over Kate Blanchett's character as a love interest. That kind of puts a lot of conflict and tension between them, and it takes a long time over this film for that relationship to finally build and for Steve to really accept Ned as his son. And the tragic thing about this movie is that by the time that Steve comes to terms with that, Ned unfortunately dies at the end of the film, and it is really a tragic scene. Wes Anderson films, yes, they're quirky, yes, they're funny and everything like that, but they're also very melancholic. They really hit you because you're kind of not expecting it. He takes you by surprise with his style and his dialogue, which is all just very lighthearted, and it puts you in a bit of a mindset where you feel comfortable with the film and the characters, and then boom, something changes, and you feel emotional because you have developed this really friendly connection with all of his characters. I think this also has a really great ending. Obviously, by the end of the film, he manages to find the shark. And I think this might be another scene where I know casual audiences might think it's a bit goofy, but this is the first time that he uses kind of claymation and stop motion, which is something that we will obviously see more in his filmography with Fantastic Mr. Fox an Isle of Dogs. So to see those little steps to him working towards those films in a way, was really cool to see this early on. And fun fact, the person that was running a lot of that animation was in fact Henry Selleck, the director of Coraline. So it's kind of just a nice little touch there. I think it works within the context of the film. And it leads to a real emotional moment, but it is very cartoonish and does feel out of place, I think, for a lot of people watching this film who aren't really expecting that from him. I wasn't expecting it, and I had seen Isle of Dogs and Fantastic Mr. Fox before this. But him seeing the shark, it leads to a real emotional moment where he just bonds with the crew, and they all come together as one as a family while Steve is crying, and it's a really, really beautiful scene. You know, there are always beautiful lines in Wes Anderson movies, and one that really sticks with me is one at the end of the film, where he asks the crew, I wonder if it remembers me. He kind of breaks down a lot of his ego throughout the film. Steve Zissou is a kind of a narcissist in a lot of ways. He definitely knows that he's the best out there, he runs his whole crew, makes his documentaries, and he doesn't really have a relationship with his crew until we really hit that moment where they all go to comfort him. Once again, really beautiful stuff here. I also have to mention Sue George is in this film. I don't know how many of you actually know him unless you're a big fan of Wes Anderson films. He has a lot of covers of David Bowie's music in this, and they are absolutely beautiful. It was just a perfect placement in this film, and a nice little supporting character. I also liked having Willem Dafoe in there as well. He kind of adds a lot of comedic relief in this film, as he's kind of not appreciated for being that number two guy to Steve as Ned comes into his life. And having that little battle there is just a nice little side arc to the film that has a nice payoff by the end. Now for me personally, when I finished this for the first time, I really did think it was one of Wes's best films. On a second watch, I like it a tad less because some of the pacing issues were a little bit more apparent in this film to me. And while I still love all of those poignant moments and all of those nice arcs, it just isn't paced to perfection. And when you see some of Wes's later films as he's starting to hit his peak, 
he has no issues in that regard, but it's something that he really had to work through early on in his career, and that issue arises here for sure. Now, I think another reason why this was dismissed by critics was that I think that they considered this film to be quite shallow, pun definitely intended by the way, because on the surface it's just this quirky little comedy with a couple of sad moments for sure, but they don't really hit you as hard unless you're looking at the nuances of the film, and people hadn't really come to terms with that in Wes Anderson's filmmaking yet. He was looked at as this very quirky director who made all these different kind of films, but they all stuck within their genre. Royal Tenenbaums definitely put him to new heights, but that was one film that really got him a lot more attention, and The Life Aquatic just is kind of stuck in this middle ground where he incorporates a lot of those really melancholic and poignant moments in the Royal Tenenbaums, but he also wants to make this a comedy like Rushmore. Overall, if I had to give this a score, I would give it probably a four and a half out of five. I still think it's an excellent movie. It's full of just so many great moments, and I highly recommend that if you are going to see it, Try and get the Criterion Collection version of it. It is just the definitive way to see these early Wes Anderson movies as they are restored and just look pristine. They look more like a modern Wes Anderson movie than a relic of the past. So definitely check it out. There's a lot of cool special features on there as well about how they made all of his films. And you kind of get a deeper appreciation for a lot of the intricate detail that Wes Anderson really values in his films. Watching the process just makes you appreciate what he's capable of and what he does in his films a whole lot more. Anyway, those are my thoughts for The Life Aquatic. Let me know what you think about this movie in the comments below. Do you think that this is one of his worst films or do you really love it? I'd love to know what you think. Next up, I will be of course reviewing the Darjeeling Limited, followed by the rest of Wes Anderson's filmography. I am seeing them all in the lead up to me finally seeing Asteroid City here in Australia. I'm so looking forward to it. And I'll definitely have a review out for that one as well as a Wes Anderson ranking. So make sure to look forward to all of that content. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.